50 is the way to fly My hostess takes our order Coffee, tea, or something stronger To start off the day It's a bloody merry morning And I'm leaving baby somewhere in the day It's a bloody merry morning Baby left me without warning sometime Getting her the nature of my flight It's a bloody merry morning, baby Left me without a warning sometime in the night So I'm flying down to Houston But forgetting her the nature of my flight We're playing a club called the Cabaret Club in Van Deer probably one of the most famous dance halls in that part of the country. It's closed now. And uh, we found out, hey, we're going to get to play with Willie Nelson. He had like two records out, or three records on the Liberty, the Liberty records. He comes walking on stage with this green band. He had his wife with him and Shirley played bass. And that's how we met him. He needed a band to go with him when he came to do his Texas dates in South Texas. So he would take us with him to go play the dance sets. And Johnny Bush was working for him at the time. We would do the dance sets. John would get up and do a little something. Willie would come on, and John would go play drums behind Willie. And that's how we got to know him. Bloody Mary Morning, Willie wrote on a plane ticket flying from Los Angeles to Houston back in 69, 70, sometime like that. And it was an album. And uh, we liked the song, and we were doing an album, so we thought, well, let me see if we can do that. So uh, we had been, at the time, working a bunch of dates with Willie at, a, at Flores Country Store in Holotus and a bunch of places around Texas. So I asked him, I said, you know, I like that song, can I record it? And he said, sure. He said, you can record anything I've got. So we did it and released it off the album as a single and got a fair amount of airplay on it. Then that was in seven, that album came out in 72. And then in 75 or so, Willie recorded it and released it as a single. And we were at a golf tournament over in Houston. All of a sudden, somebody grabbed me by the arm. And it was Willie, he says, he says, I covered you on your record. Wait a few years and cover me again. I said, well, okay. Several years later, I was sitting around thinking about re-recording that tune. So one of the guys in our band is named David Zetner, and he was the first person that Willie had hired from us. He hired David to play bass. But anyway, I called David and told him what I wanted to do, and he says, i tell you what, uh, Willie will be in in the morning, says, we always go walk and I'll call you back in a day or two. And then I forgot about it. And I was in the studio doing something, you know, and the phone rings, and hey, it's for you. I go over there and David says, uh, 
Willie says two thumbs up in G. And so I put the music together and called David when I got the music ready. And he says, well, let me see when Willie's going to be here and I'll call you. And he called a few days later and says, come on up. So I went up to Luck, Texas, the ghost town on his ranch. And we went, he had a little studio in the back room of his headquarters saloon there. And we put the vocal down and he played a little guitar on it. In Holotus, Texas, back in the early 60s, there was not near the population that there is today. Uh, we rode horseback quite a bit from where I lived, about two miles out of downtown Holotus. Um, to Flores Country Store to go dancing. In the summer, we would get to dance outside and enjoy the different artists. Uh, we used to listen to George Chambers and Bubba Littrell, Daryl McCall, um, Willie Nelson, Johnny Bush. And um, we were close enough that you could visit with them while they were in between sets. And, um, and now you hardly get a chance to visit with the artist. And, and there's a lot more uh, people in crowds and you don't get to dance because the dancing the, the floor is full. To me whenever I go to a dance hall I enjoy dancing and floors now is mainly a listening environment there's no room to dance and I really miss that. Um, my kids have that is what they're used to they they don't even expect to go to a dance hall uh, with many of the Texas artists and get to dance because there's no room. I enjoy dancing. I um, Not only do you get exercise from it, I just love dancing. Love two-step, love doing the different um, varieties of, of dance that you can do with country music. Enjoy the words. We were playing the cabaret club in Bandera, and they had a star every Saturday night. So we worked with you know, just whoever the luck of the draw was. With Loretta Lynn, she had two records out at the time. Worked with Stonewall Jackson when Waterloo was hot with George Hamilton IV when he was, you know, doing Rose and the Baby Ruth. Oh, who else did we work with up there? Hank Lachlan had the number one song in the nation at the time that, uh, when we worked with him in, in Mandera. Uh, and the guy that was booking us booked George Jones down in this part of the country, and that was before George had a band. His name was Jimmy Klein. He would book us with George at the cabaret, at the farmer's daughter, just, you know, different places. And then, you know, we did the uh, KKYX River Festival for 25 years. And I don't have a list of everybody we worked with on that that show, but there's guys like uh, Bobby Bear and Ed Bruce and, and Jim Chestnut. We worked with Randy Travis, and he had two records out, Kathy Matea, Steve Earle, who I have a long association with. Well, I taught school for a lot of years, and Steve was in my class for a year when he was a sophomore in high school. Good writer, he brought me some songs back in those days. I can't find that tape now, but there were some pretty good songs on that tape. And I, one of these years I'll find it, maybe I'll get to record one. When we were first making records, we were associated with a, a guy that worked for RCA and their distributorship down here. His name was Jesse Snyder, and he knew a lot of people, and he put us with a lot of people. We worked with Charlie Pride up in Fort Worth, a place called Panther Hall. And, worked with Hank Snow, and Jesse got all that stuff, you know, because they were all RCA artists, and they needed a band to do the dance sets again. So we'd go up and play Panther Hall with, uh, we did it with uh, Wanda Jackson, Porter Wagner, you know, all those, those guys. And where we'd do our thing, and then they'd do theirs. Some of y'all might remember When my blue moon turns to gold again When the rainbow turns the clouds away When my blue moon turns to gold again She'll be back within my arms to stay The old breeze that linger in my heart The old breeze that make my heart grow cold Someday they'll live again, sweetheart And my blue moon again will turn to gold and my blue moon turns to gold again And the rainbow turns the clouds away And my blue moon turns to gold again You'll be back within my arms to stay
Kisses that used to thrill me so For the sweetest stories ever told Now someday they'll live again, sweetheart And my blue moon again will turn to gold My blue moon turns to gold again When the rainbow turns the clouds away I got a guitar when I was eight years old, and uh, we had just moved to Texas, 1946, whatever year it was, last century. And uh, I took lessons from a lady named Mrs. Hafner, and she lived way over off of, uh, almost downtown off of Main Avenue uh, in San Antonio here. And I'd get on the bus, after school and take my guitar and I'd go over there and I'd do a 30 minute lesson and she'd tell me what to do. And then I, at that time we were living in, in San Antonio proper. And I'd ride the bus back. Here I was, third grade, fourth grade, whatever it was. You know, I was gonna be a big cowboy singer star. You know, that was back in the days of Roy and Gene and, and all that stuff. And uh, you know, the Western swing guys like Spade Cooley and, and uh, Bob Wills and, that much, so I wanted to. I, was, I wanted to be a singer, and uh, so I got a guitar, it was an old Regal guitar. Plunked around on that thing. When I finally got to high school, there were a bunch of guys around there that that played some, and even a little before that, we'd been doing some playing. With uh, you know, we'd found us a steel guitar player named Don Misher, who uh, has gone on to be a big, big name producer for NBC. And Don played steel, and Jerry Blanton, who plays steel now in the band, was playing lead guitar then. And uh, gosh, I don't remember who all was in the band at that time. That was in the early 50s. And, you know, it's always somebody knew somebody. Somebody's mother knew John T. Floor, and he needed a Sunday band. This was in September of 1952. And so we took our band out there, and we had a piano player named Paul Kime, who's a well known Western artist. Uh, you know, art, you know, Western scenery things. And I uh, had a guy named Kenny Price that played upright bass, and Don and Jerry and me, and somebody played fiddle, and I don't remember who it was. We had a six piece man, but we thought we were stars. We played out there for the kitty on Sunday afternoons, and we'd make like $10 a man just in the pot. Well, in 1952, $10 was like $100 now or better. You know, we thought we were rich. First time I met George Chambers was probably 1963. I'd been to San Antonio a long time and worked with area bands like Texas Top Hands for the for a Lone Star beer. And we traveled a lot. Uh, didn't work San Antonio too often. But this was 63 and I had uh, went to work with Willie Nelson. Willie and I had been friends for years and uh, after he started having hit records, formed a band. He left Nashville and moved to Fort Worth, so while we were off, I got a call from uh, George Chambers, going to work uh, Cherry Springs. I remember they picked me up on uh, Hebrew Road and uh, at Fredericksburg Road, an old Cadillac limo, and we uh, played Cherry Springs Tavern at night. I really in, enjoyed uh, myself that night. I, I guess they liked me too. We become friends after that. I think what impresses me most about George Chambers is his uh, friendliness, his openness, and his sincerity. 
Uh, I like his singing. I like his style. And uh, I guess if you counted all the musicians and friends of mine in San Antonio and anywhere else, he would uh, be way high on the top ten of being a friend. Not an acquaintance, but a friend. And we've been knowing each other, I guess, since that night for a long, long time. And, and uh, I can't say enough good things about him. Before this interview is over, I'll think of something bad. <laughs> <laughs> when country, traditional country, started coming back real strong in the 60s, after rock and roll had beat us to death, George and a country gentleman started listening to these records and learning these songs. And the likes of the Texas Top Hands and uh, Adolf Hoffner was not doing that. And when, uh, back in those days, if an artist had a, a single hit record, he was able to book at a cheaper price and the clubs were, were, were able to book the artist. Then the problem was, well, how could we have a band that could play this guy's record and make it sound like the record? Well, George Chambers and a country gentleman fit right into that. And uh, they started learning the new country songs of the day, which were from 60, 61, 62, 63. They backed every country artist that come through San Antonio uh, better than anybody else could at the time. They were, there were some other bands playing traditional country, but they were People like Bubba Littrell and, and uh, people like that, but they were, they would sit down in one place. Uh, George and them would play Cherry Springs, they would play Fredericksburg, Pat's Hall, they'd play uh, Silver Spur, Bandera Cabaret, the old hi uh, and, and back then we had, we still had five military installations, had uh, Enlisted Man's Club, uh, NCO, Officers Club, so that's three or four clubs times five. So there was a lot of places to play. Well, these Nashville booking agencies would book uh, these acts in a single, George would get the job. And, he, and they'd done real well with that. Before Willie Nelson organized his band, when he'd come to Texas, what uh, George would, would back Willie Nelson. And that's not an easy thing to do if you've ever heard uh, some of Willie's songs and, and the way he phrased it, it wasn't the easiest thing for a lot of bands to do. I can't think of any act that, that he didn't play behind uh, in the 60s. If the act called for a band, uh, they, they called George and said, can you play with this guy or this lady? And I think that's how he really got his foot in the door. And he started making his own records. And uh, they were then and still are a great band when they get together. Uh, they still play good traditional country music. There's not as many active dance halls now as there used to be. And some of that's due to the entertainment options have changed. You know, back in, uh, when we started playing, the Saturday night, especially if you're in the hill country or southeast of here toward the coast, you know, back in, the, in that area, that Saturday night thing was to go to a dance somewhere. And you can go through towns down close to Floresville and down in that area, that area of Texas. And there's dance halls in every town, Wee Sag Hall and Panama Maria and all these dance halls because that was the big recreation. And now uh, most of those are, they're still, the calls are still there, but they're not doing much unless it's a special event or some such thing as that. And places like Schrader Hall in, in Schrader, Texas, uh, they're still operational as far as I know, and, and uh, but the cabaret in Bandera is not there, but the building's there, but the club's closed. Pat's Hall in Fredericksburg is closed. And we played Pat's for 20 years, uh, you know, 14 times a year. George Strait played Pat's Hall back when it was Ace and the whole band. They were running out of San Marcos, you know. And the Crystal Chandelier in New Braunfels, really a nice, nice dance hall. Uh, we played that played their grand opening and played there for a long time. The Blue Bonnet Palace, the original Blue Bonnet Palace out on uh, 35 at Selma is gone. U Valley had a place called the Purple Sage, nice hall. 
the building's probably still there, but the halls, you know, they're not operational anymore. You know, it's really kind of sad to see all that go away. When I die, I may not go to heaven. I don't know if they let cowboys in. And if they don't, just let me go to Texas. Cause Texas is as close as I've been. New York couldn't hold my attention. Detroit City couldn't sing my song. If tomorrow finds me busted fat in Dallas, I won't care, cause at least I'll know I'm home. When I die, I may not go to heaven. I don't know if they let cowboys in. And if they don't, just let me go to Texas. Cause Texas is as close as I've been. All of hell and half of Texas Just to hear George Chambers sing a country song The beard just ain't as cold as old Milwaukee My body's here but my soul's in San Antonio Now when I die I may not go to heaven Cause I don't know if they let cowboys in they don't just let me go to Texas Cause Texas is as close as I've been Yeah, when I die, I may not go to heaven Cause I don't know if they let cowboys in If they don't, just let me go to Texas Cause Texas is as close as I've been yeah, Texas is as close as I've been. Initially, the idea for most of the 20th century in radio was that you could only have seven radio stations, seven AMs or seven FMs. And that was due to the Communications Act of 1934. In the 80s, uh, Congress and the FCC came up with this thing called Docket 8090. And it, the idea was to create a whole lot more uh, radio stations, make them more available to various groups of people, create diversity. and. Uh, they were supposed to be all low-power radio stations, 3,000-watt, what they call Class A FMs. All kinds of people applied for these radio stations all over the country. Only problem with that is, over time, by moving these stations around and moving other stations around, only 3,000-watt radio stations all of a sudden became 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000-watt radio stations because by using engineering methods, they would move the stations around. So. Towns that uh, worked hard to get one radio station in a suburb, all of a sudden that was gone and was in a big city. So cities like Austin, Houston, any kind of big city in Texas, all of a sudden went from having maybe eight or 10 radio stations, having 15 or 20. Over time, uh, the FCC and, uh, raised the level to 10 and then 12, and I think maybe finally 20. And then with the Communications Act of 1996, they made it unlimited. 
And that's when the modern era of radio consolidation just took off and created, you know, 10 or 12 giant companies for radio. A lot of, a lot of good things came out of this consolidation. Uh, in the old days, none of us had health insurance or 401ks or that sort of thing. And consolidation created that. As far as the programming issues, at first, it was really pretty cool because all of a sudden, uh, you had all this great new equipment, and that's when equipment and radio business had not changed for 30 years, 30 or 40 years, from early 60s to the 90s. And uh, all of a sudden you had computers and were able to do all these neat seeking things and it, it, it really uh, had a positive effect. Over time, as more and more consolidation took, took place, and, and guys basically, like my mom said, their, their eyes were bigger than their stomachs when you took too much food. These guys, a lot of people paid ungodly amounts of money for these radio stations and ultimately couldn't handle the debt on them. Money got tighter and there was more and more consolidation. Finally, it started really affecting programming. More and more became more corporate control. Uh, they would uh, dictate, first of all, you could only add two or three uh, records yourself on a, on a weekly basis or however the, your company added them. Uh, just a few, and then and then finally uh, they got where you couldn't add any. <laughs> you played just what they had, and they did everything very very safe based on research. So it just it killed a lot of the old days. I remember when we were in Austin, uh, we got local ra local radio stations uh, used to get hundreds of records a week from people all over the country, and we got a record from a guy named Arnie Rue, and he was he played lounges in Los Angeles, and we played the record and thought it was kind of cool. And so our morning guy started playing it on the air, and we created kind of a cult following for this guy, Arnie Rue. We, we finally brought him into Austin. He played the, one of the old honky-tonks here, the Silver Dollar, and we had a couple thousand people come out and see him. Well, that sort of thing went far away, and it went even further away with just local groups of bands that played, you know, played forever. I remember we had a band here called the People's Choice. Well, in those days, I was here in Austin, you put out a record, you know, we'd play it, we'd talk about the group and all that. All that went further and further away with this consolidation. I don't think necessarily that's what was intended to be done with it, but it, it cut out a lot of the great services at radio. It cut, they cut news departments way down. There was hardly any local news. Everything became feel good stuff. It, it was all lifestyle oriented things, you know, a uh, dog got locked in the car and let the owner out or whatever, rather than informative news of a local nature because they didn't have people to do it. And, and it's, um, it really stymied a lot of people in the business. It was no longer fun because in the old days you just could, you would, these people were your friends. The musicians were your friends. The police people were your friends. The politicians were your friends. You knew all these folks. And that, that became further and further removed and, and it really still is. And it's left largely to uh, the news part, to television and the music part has been taken up by other media. You know, the original, uh, intent of radio was to serve the public interest, convenience, and necessity. Uh, that was in the uh, Communication Act of 1934, and all the old-time radio guys learned that, you know, and that the owners were very aware of these. You had to prove you were doing that. You had to keep records. Well, records are kept today, and in my experience, but they're not, they're not worried about very much. And when I started in radio in the early 60s, I think there were 1,200 radio stations in the United States. Today, I think there are around 15,000 radio stations. And the government agency, like a lot of other governmental agencies, the FCC can't really monitor and control and deal with all of those things. Uh, I think there was too much control for a long time. Today, I think there's probably too little control. All the guys that are still in the business, when I see them, all they want to do is whine about how bad it is and how it sucks. I says, you're, you're telling Noah about the flood, brother. I think that they've lost a generation of young people who initially, as kids, everybody got their music off the radio. That's where the new music came, and that's where you learned about old music, and that's where you could, uh, by various stations specializing in different kinds of music, you know, you were, you were educated, uh, uh, whether it was you're listening to something as, as diverse as if you were an Anglo listening to Tejano music, to uh, listening to your, your uh, Frank Sinatra and uh, Tony Bennett, to George Jones and George Strait. Uh, you, you, you learned about all types of music and um, rock and roll lived off of that. You know, top 40 and rock and roll lived off of 
I'll let record right out of the box. And in my day, it was uh, a kid from Fort Worth, uh, a woman from Fort Worth, and a guy from uh, Harlingen uh, cut a record called Hey Paula, and it went to number one in the 60s. And they cut it literally in a some crummy studio in Fort Worth, and it was number one record. And you had this all the time happening, and uh, sometimes they spread nationally. Texas had a lot of those guys, from Ray Peterson, San Antonio, uh, what was the group? Uh, uh, Question Mark and the Mysterians out of the Rio Grande Valley, uh, 96 Tears. These were all regional groups that had big giant hits all over the country in the 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s. And now, you know, that opportunity is gone, and that's where kids learned about the new music, and it's, it's all gone. One of the things that has led to the loss of this young generation of, of radio listeners, and I'd say they're mostly people under 25 uh, these days, uh, maybe even under 30, uh, is that is the ascension of the social media, uh, as well as every kid in the world knows how to get music off the internet. And uh, they, it's, it's instantaneous. A lot of the things radio used to serve, a lot of the purposes radio used to serve. You see it especially, I think, and I, I can speak to my own experience in Texas, where you have this whole genre of uh, Texas musicians out there, mostly of a country vein. And they're very successful. They're college educated. They're smart. They cut their own, their own their, they cut whatever songs they want to. They use their band or their buddies, or whoever they want to. Uh, a lot of them do it in Austin, San Antonio, wherever, Houston, they've done everywhere. Then they uh, have a nice circuit they play from uh, Amarillo to Lubbock to uh, College Station to Kingsville to Corpus Christi or whatever, and they sell those CDs for you know, 15, 20 bucks a piece, and I guess they keep about 95% of whatever it costs. And they're very successful. They have a cadre of loyal listeners that go around, and so, They've captured the new technology and 90% of what these guys do, not on the radio. The, these new musicians that have this music are the only ones that are very successful in the old uh, local club venues anymore, you know, they, uh, that, that they can afford to see, so the kids all know them. And I think it's as much, uh, that's a result of, the, of the, these new musicians, these Texas country guys, if you will, have, have, have grasped the new technology and really made it work for them. Uh, now, what's happened now is uh, satellite radio. And people are saying, well, why should I uh, pay so much a month for s satellite radio? Well, I can turn on radio. and uh, Well, if you do, if you turn on radio station now, you're going to hear about 10 records over and over and over and over and over. Plus commercial, commercial, commercial. Uh, with XM Radio, you've got 150 channels, say. You've got two or three traditional country. You'll hear Roy Cub, uh, Ray Price, Bill Monroe, and you'll also hear the new country artists that are coming out now. Traditional country, but they're, but they're new. Not only that, with satellite radio, plays your record, they play my record, anybody else's, they pay a royalty. Well, uh, mainstream radio never did that. The only time you got paid from a record being played on mainstream is if you wrote it, and they had to log it, and then BMI or ASCAP, whoever you were with, would send you the money. Well, with satellite radio, uh, they're playing traditional country music. And it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger every day. I've noticed in the past three years, more people are listening now than ever have. Uh, sure, they can still listen to mainstream uh, radio, but you'll run out. If you're going from here to Dallas or Oklahoma City or California, and you got a station on uh, that you like, you're going to run out of the signal. Well, with, with XM or Sirius Radio, you won't run out of the signal. And it's, it's good and clear, and there's, and there's no commercials. And it's just pennies a month, you know. So it is really, I see it, for the traditional country music, it is our future. And it's getting stronger and stronger. The last three years, it's really gotten stronger. You know, the record business has changed so much 
but when I'm not going to stop making records just you know because we you know we can sell them off the bandstand and, and put them on uh, CD baby or you know some of the internet record outlets so that's an honest you know keep on playing well I'm back in the saddle again out where I'm What you see here are pictures of a landfill near San Antonio, Texas. All cities have them, and despite noble efforts to recycle, landfills are still necessary and they are still growing in size. Change in technology is creating much of what we discard as a society, including those jobs lost as a result of radio consolidation. Each year, Tons of older cell phones, computers, and batteries are replaced with newer models. It seems to be an unavoidable byproduct of progress, but it's not just technology. The rate of overall change in our culture is staggering. According to the National School Board Association, today's high school graduates have been exposed to a greater body of knowledge than their grandparents were in their entire lifetimes. And what's more, there will be as much change in the next three decades as there was in the last 300 years. Change is inevitable. One generation replaces another. Baby boomers replace the builder generation. Generation X is replacing the boomers. Y will replace X and so on. Public taste in everything changes too, including taste in music. George Strait replaced Kenny Rogers, who replaced Mel Tillis at the top of the country music charts. Someone will eventually replace Strait if it hasn't happened already. But unlike yesteryear, change today takes place in a matter of months, not years. When Microsoft introduced Windows 7, old computer hardware and software became obsolete almost overnight. Sure, the old gear still works, but it has no future because of changing technology. I think what is missing in this fast lane of change in which we live is the ability or even the willingness to savor or value things that have happened to us as a society in the past. We are so busy trying to make sense of the flood of change as it rises around us that we fail to remember important life events. These things should not be hauled off to the landfills of our minds to be buried beneath the trash we should forget. I decided to do this project because I want to remember clearly the life's work of my friend George Chambers. We need to hold on to our fading memories. I've got fading memories in my mind Fading memories of 
good time Dance all Saturday night With occasional good old boy fight I've got fading memories in my mind Back when we were young This was a small town state We didn't get a TV until 1958 Daddy was a hard-working railroad man Mama raised us kids We didn't have much, but we had good times Yes, we surely did I've got fading memories in my mind Fading memories of good times Dance all Saturday night With occasional good old boy fights I've got fading memories in my mind All the traveling bands came to our hometown. Everyone played the Cotton Eye Joe. We danced the night away while Bob Will's Playboys played. We were never ready when Mama said. It's time to go I've got fading memories in my mind Fading memories of good times That whole Saturday night With occasional good old boy fights I've got fading memories in my mind I've got fading